Good morning. Good morning. Welcome into worship today. It is great to see everyone as we do gather in on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's slightly less beautiful than, say, a couple days ago, and it was still 70 out, but we'll take it. It is beautiful. It is sunny, and uh, that's always a great sign, too. Um, so, again, welcome in this morning. A couple announcements as we uh, do begin uh, worship this morning. Uh, you see the couple things that are coming up the next couple of Sundays on the screen. I also want to mention uh, that as far as I'm aware, Pam Van Kirk uh, mentioned that over the weekend, the new Ukrainian refugee family that's moving to town was going to be moving into the parish house. So if you see a new family coming in and out of the uh, parish house, that's the new Ukrainian family. Um, we do have information about that in the, the newsletter that's going out as well. Uh, Stepan and Alessia have moved to an apartment here in town and are doing well and progressing in their uh, various steps of becoming fully settled here. And now we welcome this new family and uh, we'll begin helping them as they transition uh, into our community as well. Uh, the newsletter also indicates the types of things that uh, the group is looking to uh, collect in terms of donations for uh, the family, so watch for that information. If you need to pick up a hard copy of that newsletter, we do have a few copies available here today. Otherwise, it gets emailed out tomorrow. I want to also take a moment to recognize some accomplishment, uh, an accomplishment by one of our very own here. We have Elise, oh, she's embarrassed already, uh, who recently received Student Athlete of the Week honors for all her accomplishments. So congratulations, Elise. Uh, it's quite the, quite the deal. Those are some of the things that I want to lift up here as we come into worship today. Uh, one uh, other thing to, to make you aware of, I will be out of the office uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, but will be accessible by phone or email. So if you need to reach me in the next two days, uh, that's how you will reach me. I'm going to be up at our church camp uh, and I'm actually going to be saying a little bit more about that in a little bit about why I'll be up there, but um, but yes, if you need to reach me in the next couple of days, phone or email, and uh, I'll be able to get back to you. Then if I miss the phone call right away, I will get back to you as soon as I'm able. With that, we'll take a few moments to center ourselves, let the Holy Spirit breathe in and out of us, draw us closer into the presence of the Divine who is with us this morning as we prepare for worship now, listening to Janice and our prelude music.
invite you to stand now as we start fresh this day with our moment of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who redeems us in Christ Jesus, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have ignored voices that call for your justice. We have neglected actions that witness to your righteousness. We have spoken and acted in ways that disrupt your beloved community. We truly repent of the things we have done and left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Restore our troubled spirits, so that we may live in newness, follow the way of the Spirit, and build up the body of Christ. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. God hears the prayers of all who cry out, and restores us to life through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let's take a moment now to share a sign of God's peace. Our opening hymn this morning is, How Firm a Foundation.
Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not irresponsible when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked day and night so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have the right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, anyone unwilling willing to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living irresponsibly, mere busybodies not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not worry in doing what is right. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and this time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They'll hand you over to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and siblings, by relatives and friends, and I'll put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Chicken Little is one of those uh, children's nursery rhymes that goes back forever in terms of storytelling in the various cultures. Most recently, Disney teamed up with Pixar back in, I think it was around 2005, and they did an animated feature around the character. The little chicken that they drew uh, kind of resembled our little at the time, Nathaniel, with the head and the glasses and everything. It was kind of cute and adorable. So we called him Chicken Little for a while because he looked like that character in the show. Of course, Disney takes this story and does what Disney does with it. Gives it a little bit of a spin. So Chicken Little's worries about the sky falling justified as something actually is happening. And this character that everybody worries about and tells is crazy turns out to be right and ends up being the hero in the story. That's because that's what Disney does with these nursery rhymes. As we know, a lot of these stories and tales that Disney takes and makes into their feature animated films come from much darker backgrounds. 
you don't want to know some of the real endings to some of the stories because they can be pretty brutal. Chicken Little, in fact, as in some of its earlier tellings and the ways the stories were collected and brought together, also a much darker vision. In one telling, Chicken Little, who also is sometimes called Henny Penny, is gathering all of these other creatures up because she felt an acorn hit her head and she's ground and determined to believe that means the sky is falling and everything is going to end. And on their way to warn their king, they get caught by a fox who naturally invites them all in and provides a place of safety for them, his oven, and uh, he has a wonderful feast on all of these dooms and naysayers. Much darker vision. The story originates not just uh, in a single culture, but in lots of different cultures around the world, in stories that lift up this great concern for when we feel the great fear and dread that everything is falling apart around us. What are we going to do? Are we going to be succumbed to that fear? Is it going to crush us and ultimately kill us? And the world's going to keep on going and we're worried for nothing? Or are we going to find a way to endure through it? In his own way, Jesus is using this moment in Luke's Gospel to be this chicken little kind of moment. They have come to Jerusalem. This is in the days that lead up to what we know as uh, the Passion stories, the days when Jesus will be betrayed and arrested and crucified and ultimately lead to Easter Sunday. Some of those gathered around Jesus and his disciples are amazed and marvel at the beauty of this temple, the wonders that this is. Uh, in, in, in Herod and Herod's father in rebuilding the temple spared no expense in making this truly a glorious space by human standards. Gold inlay, the fancy woods, all of it all the fancy, richest statues and, and everything else that can be used as symbols to glorify God there in the space. It was magnificent. And on one of the other gospel stories, it's not just some speaking about it, but it's the disciples themselves who are awed and fascinated by this amazing sight that is the temple. Jesus takes us his moment to see how his disciples are going to react if he gives them a little bit of a chicken little scenario, right? The sky's falling, guys. All of this that you see, it's all going to come tumbling down. Now, in Jesus' day, he's able to say this as a prediction of something that will happen down the road. When Luke is writing his gospel and recording these stories, it's perhaps five to ten years after the temple had actually been destroyed by the Romans. An insurrection of Jewish people had risen up, attempted again to violently overthrow Rome's authority in Jerusalem and kick them out, and the emperor in Rome said, that's it, I've had enough of these people, and has marched the soldiers in there, they've had a bit of a conflict, it took three years, and the Romans finally uh, squashed it, uh, pretty decidedly. And they marched in and they just raised that glorious temple, tore it all down, and they put up in its place monuments to the Roman gods. So for the original hearers of Luke's gospel, this isn't just a Jesus prediction of something that's going to happen, it's something they're actually experiencing. The sky is actually falling on us at this moment. Insurrections are happening. Nations against nations is happening. Kingdoms against kingdoms is happening. Jesus' response is kind of a test. What's going what's to be your reaction? Are you going to succumb to the fears and worries and concerns of all this stuff which ultimately Jesus is telling us is temporary? 
Or are you going to stay steadfast in the faith and stand? Through it all. Because you know a greater thing is, is going to win the, the eternal day. And again, for Jesus, in his time, he's saying this just days ahead of when he's going to be crucified. And people are going to see what they assume is his actual end until three days later when the tomb is empty and he rises again. For those Christians in 8085 who are hearing Luke's gospel for the first time, they have seen the death and they're waiting for that resurrection moment again. Will we rise in that resurrection? Well, fast forward 2,000 some years. And here we are today. With the chicken little scenario still playing out constantly in our culture. We actually had an insurrection, as it's been labeled by the media, and as it played out on January 6th, a couple of years ago. We have in our political circles strife that continues to be mostly about fear-mongering. Mostly about doomsday. Mostly about if the other side wins, it's all over. You know, I we get some politicians who lift up some hope around here, but we don't get that very often. We get the naysayers. We get the fear mongers. Everyone wants you to be afraid of something. The words of Jesus continue to be an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, are we going to fall victim to this fear-mongering that's taking place around us, or are we going to stand fast within our faith, knowing and trusting the victory of Christ, knowing and trusting that what is temporary will not actually win the day, no matter what it looks like, but the victory is in Christ, the resurrection, the newness of life. One of those arenas of our public life where this plays out a lot is uh, through environmental concerns. There's a lot of doomsaying out there about the environment. It doesn't take much to start reading different articles about how the environment is changing dramatically. From reports about intense storms that are stronger than they were years earlier, to sea levels rising, I was reading an article yesterday that suggests that sea levels might rise along the coast 9 to 12 inches within the next 80 years or so. It's a dramatic change. It may not impact us here in the Midwest because we're in the middle of nowhere near an ocean, but a lot of coastal cities are going to experience dramatic change if that prediction comes true. The fear-mongering around this theme also plays out in our politics. As different politicians decry one policy after another, hoping to draw us into the fear of everything. So Jesus gives us an opportunity in this context to say, are we going to succumb to the fear of it all, or are we going to rise above it? And stand fast in our faith. And when it comes to environmental causes and the climate change of our society, we need to rise above the fear-mongering that is the politics and stand fast in the faithfulness that our God calls us to in the midst of this. See, environmental causes are not just a political fighting point. Environmental causes is very much a faith matter. And how we treat and react to creation around us is very much an expression of our faith. Think about it. In just a few moments after our hymn of the day, we're going to begin the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Or if we were to start with the Nicene Creed, it would be, uh, I believe, God the Father, maker of all things. This is a matter of faith. 
And as a matter of faith, we rise above the fears of everything and we approach things looking at how does our faith lead us in confidence as we address climate issues around us. There's a couple things that we can do that start to draw us into it and, and help us to appreciate how this is a faith matter more so than even a political matter. One of those things is something I'm going to be a part of over the next couple of days, in fact. Some of you know, because I've talked about it in the past, and I'm a part of the uh, Creation uh, Cares Committee uh, here in our Synod. I've spent a couple weeks uh, out of the last couple of years uh, gathering with others from across the Synod, developing a variety of liturgical resources around the theme of creation. Uh, last year, also in Advent, uh, our committee put together short videos for the whole season of Advent, little Advent devotionals, if you will. And we're taking those videos one step further this year. And we're adding in some liturgical pieces around it, a prayer and, and some music. Different congregations from across the center are going to be involved in different ways. And I myself will be included in terms of uh, leading some of the prayers before the meetings that take place this year. The readings come from a short little devotional for Advent. It's a book called All Creation Waits, The Advent Mystery of New Beginnings. It's by Gail Wass. It's, it, it's meant as an Advent devotional. Every day in the season of Advent is another story based on another animal. Here's the one on the muskrat on uh, Advent 2. Um, the common loon, a wood frog, a raccoon, just some of the examples. The opossum, common garter snake, um, are just some of the examples of some of the animals that are in here. The idea is that as you're reading through this, you're reading a short little story that tells you something about this animal. Something about its daily life. Something about how it is in its environment. Something that tells you uh, something about its happenings. They're not really a whole lot of deep theological insights about these animals or, or God. It's just a snippet about the things that take place in this animal's life. When the videos are produced and ready to be released, I will be sharing them through our social media and our website so that we as a congregation can watch them at home on our own and engage in a different way of approaching Advent with daily devotions. As a faith expression, this gives us pause. As a faith expression, it gives us a moment to let the Holy Spirit infuse in us and remind us of our connectivity to all of creation. As a faith expression, it tells us that I am a brother to the porcupine, or the wild turkey, or the little brown bat, or the cottontail, or the white-tailed deer, or the chickadee, all these different animals. And if I take a moment to be reminded that I am a sibling to these creatures, that share this earth with me, then I'm reminded that I am responsible as a person of faith for caring for these creatures. Not because the sky is falling, not because the world is coming to an end, but because God is creator of me and of these sibling creatures, and it is my calling that God has given to me to care for the environment around them. Another resource that we can use that would help draw us attention to these different things is a particular Bible. It is uh, called the Green Bible. This is my copy. It, it has the, the text, the standard text, the New Revised Standard Version. It doesn't change any of the words of Scripture. All of what we know that Scripture is here. But the editors go through Scripture. Uh, you may be familiar with the red line, uh, or, red lettered edition, right, where they take all the words of Jesus and color them in red. Well, this one uses the color green and uses green to highlight verses that draw us into awareness of God and what God is doing and how creation is being lifted up in the different passages. In fact, in today's reading, the Gospel reading from today, the verse that's lifted up as green is where Jesus says, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against nation. 
There'll be great earthquakes in various places, famine and plagues, and there'll be dreadful potents and great signs from the heaven. That's in green. Let's draw your attention to somehow creation is an agent for something that's taking place in the workings of God. Another way to draw our attention to our relationship to God. To know that when the earth shakes violently and disrupts whole communities as it does when earthquakes happen, something about God is happening in that moment and we need to pay attention to it. Or when the nations rise against nation, or when we see signs that are in the heavens, we have to stop and ask ourselves, what is this? Is this a sky is falling moment or is this a time for me to stand up and be faithful and demonstrate the hope and the victory that is in Christ? From devotional moments like that, we then begin to realize there are actual things we can do. Little things that we can do that end up having large impacts. Take, for example, one of the things that our congregation has done over the last year, two years or so now, we've had a variety of energy audits. And these energy audits have resulted in programs that have come in to replace a whole lot of light bulbs that we have around here and change them from energy sapping to energy efficient lighting. For those who in particular have been in our fellowship hall last Sunday after uh, worship for that wonderful meal that we had, by the way. Thank you for all those who put that on last week. It was a great meal. Uh, maybe you looked up and noticed the lighting. A, it's a lot brighter downstairs than it had been. And yet, even with it being brighter, those lights are so much more energy efficient than what we had there before. It's a simple little step. It says we can use less energy to do the same thing. And when we use less energy here, it reduces our need from oh, those places that produce energy. And when we reduce our need from those places that reduce, produce energy, we are taking less resources from the earth. And when we're taking less resources from the earth, we are creating a better environment for those creatures who we're siblings with where their environment is better protected, better cared for, and, and better able to be there for future generations. If we lived in just the sky is falling moment, if we just succumb to that fear, we're going to feel the weight of all the problems of the world and just curl up the ball and stop functioning and just think there's nothing we can do. We just leave it to politicians to keep arguing over and shut it all off and pretend it isn't an issue. But when we step up in the faith, when we hear the calling of Jesus to shun that and step up in our faith, we remember that God is the creator and we are a partner with God in the continuation of this creation. The sky is not falling. The sky is very much going to be where the sky is forever. As people of faith, we can engage in ways of protecting the creation around us that shuns the fear-mongering but lifts up the hope. A quote attributed to Martin Luther once was, even if I knew the end of the world was coming tomorrow, I'd still plant a tree today. In the face of the Middle Ages fear-mongering that was going on and the worries that all things were going to end, Martin Luther was like, yep, yeah, so what? Let the world end tomorrow, I'm planting a tree. If the fear-mongering all leads to the end of the world is tomorrow, so what? We have victory in Christ. We know that there will always be the newness. We know there will be a greater thing coming. And until that day comes, we live in that hope. And when we live in that hope, we affect the change around us in the ways we can. 
I look forward to joining with you this Advent season in those daily devotions that our synod produces, that I will be a part of, that other congregations from across our synod will be a part of. I look forward to continuing to engage with you in different ideas and hopeful expressions of faithfulness towards creation, from the simple energy audits to the grander conversations of how we use different products out of our kitchen to how we go around uh, the whole community and lift up better ways of being in partnership with creation around us. By our endurance, Jesus says, by our endurance in that work, we will gain not only our souls, but the peace that surpasses all understanding as we continue to be in partnership with all of creation around us. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we sing our hymn of the day when the pain of the world surrounds us. our faith using these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United with your saints across time and place, we pray for our shared world. Reviving God, keep your church active in its mission and ministry. Encourage bishops, deacons, pastors, and lay leaders to risk boldly in their proclamation and fill them with wisdom and endurance for challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, you on earth. Renewing God, as the Northern Hemisphere prepares for winter, make us mindful of the ordered beauty of your creation. Teach us to treasure cycles of rest and new life. Help us care for what you have made. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Loving God, accompany all who make sacrifices for the sake of others. Safeguard first responders and active duty military personnel. Grant peace to veterans and heal any wounds in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, Healing God, your people cry out to you. Sustain doctors, nurses, and hospital personnel in their tireless work. Uphold mental health professionals and, their, and those in their care. May the sun of righteousness rise on all who are sick, especially Diane, Matthew, Linda, Dave, Cassie and family, Amber, Julie, Jackson, Chris, Pat, Isla, Norman, Carolyn, Cecil, Tad, Kathy, Dolores, Bob, Elliot and parents, Bob and Kathy. Lord, in your mercy, this is our prayer. Uniting God, unite this assembly in its shared mission and ministry for the sake of the gospel. Highlight ways we can better work together and give us patience to work through disagreement. Lord, in your mercy, this is our prayer. Consoling God, abide with all who grieve for loved ones who have died. Comfort us with the promise of resurrection and new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, this is our prayer. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now for offerings gathered through many and various ways, given with the spirit of joy and thankfulness, we pray. Blessed are you, maker of all things, as you have entrusted to us all that you have created. Now gather our gifts Nourish us in this sacrament and send us to those who hunger and thirst. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. We sing now, let the vineyards be fruitful.
our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. cross opened his arms to all. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all the drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and his ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. And teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing now, Lamb of God. table. You have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn today with peace like a river.
God of peace, who creates all things and calls them good, who makes us alive in Jesus, who breathes on us the spirit of hope, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, be a blessing in the world. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.